Okay, <clears throat> now as I said in an email, we're going to do um, a little bit of probability and a little bit of Ramsey theory and some applications of probability in our last two classes. Uh, we're going to be discussing probability, and I've got to put things in the context of things that are games of chance, the concept of gambling. Uh, and I, I have this disclaimer here. I'm not endorsing gambling. Uh, but historically, the study of probability has its roots in gambling. People wanted to understand, in particular, the game of roulette. Uh, and they wanted to know how, how, what kind of strategy should one have in placing wagers on, on, a, real, on a roulette. Does everybody know what a roulette wheel is? Okay. If you don't, that's okay. But um, again, we will be talking about gambling, but that's only because that's the, the right context for the problems that we're going to discuss. Um, so some motivating examples. Here's a couple of games. You know, people all over the world play games. Alice rolls a pair of dice. Is there anybody who doesn't know what a die or a pair of dice is? Each, okay, so she rolls a pair of dice. If she rolls doubles, she scores two points. Everybody know what doubles is. Otherwise, Dave scores D minus two points where D is the difference. So if the difference is one, Dave scores minus one. In other words, Alice still scores one. If the difference is two, like a four and a two or a five and a three, then it's a wash. Nobody wins anything. But if the difference is, is three, like four and one or five and two, then Dave wins one point. If the difference is four, then Dave wins two points. And if the difference is three, then Dave wins three points. All right, so each time the game is played, somebody wins some points or if the difference is exactly two, then it's a tie. And, okay. and you can imagine this game being played over and over and over again because they're bored and they don't have anything better to do. They should be studying, but they're not. They're playing games. Who wins this game? Is this a fair game? Is it 50-50? What's your intuition tell you? Who wins? Well, and if you know the personality of Alice, Alice doesn't play unless she wins. And, but Dave's pretty smart. And if you read the text, this example is taken right out of the text. Alice points out to Dave, look, the most I can ever win is two, and you can win three. If, if you get a difference of five, like a six and a one, then Dave wins three. <laughs> So Alice tries to convince Dave that this is a fair game. Dave's not so sure. And I'm asking you, what's your intuition? What do you think? And most of you are, are nodding and thinking that Alice wins. It's pretty close. And we will see later how close. All right, example two. Bob flips a coin, a fair coin, 10 times. He wins three points if it splits the way you kind of expect it to. Five heads, five tails. But if there's any other outcome, like six and four, seven and three, eight and two, nine and one, or all 10, then Ching wins one point. Fair game or not? What's your intuition tell you? Would you favor, if you were just watching from the sideline, would you put your money on Bob or Shink? Is it obvious? I don't think so. I don't think so. And as we're going to see, it's actually pretty close. Pretty close. All right, example three. Carlos rolls a die. If it results in a six, the game is over and he wins. 
if he doesn't roll a six, the score that he rolls is called point. Now, he rolls the dice over and over and over again until one of two things happens. One, he rolls the die and he gets a six. But now, if he rolled a six on the first turn, it's a win. If he rolls a six later, it's a loss. What he's trying to do is to match his point. So he keeps rolling until he either gets a six and he loses, or he matches his point and he wins. And he rolls and rolls and rolls until one of those two outcomes results. Carlos is playing against Zori. Carlos is doing the rolling. Zori is a passive. She's not doing anything, but she either wins or loses. Well, she wins when Carlos loses. Who's in the winning position here? Carlos or Zori? Are you sure? You're not supposed to be sure. And maybe it's obvious, but... Out, out of the three, this one is actually, it's distinguished in that there's, there's infinitely many possibilities. It's also a little bit easier to see who is in the winning position. All right, we're going to come back to these, but I want you to keep them in mind. Now, let's take some more real-world examples. Your family buys a TV at Costco for $800, and there they're offering you an insurance policy for $200 for full repair replacement for the first three years that you own the TV. Should you buy the policy or not? <laughs> and you're thinking, wait a minute, this isn't a mathematics question. This is, uh, you know, how, how averse to risk are you? And do you have the cash flow at the moment? Okay, but that's real life that the applications of probability are not necessarily 100% well-defined mathematical problems. Example two, Chick-fil-A is going to put up a new franchise, and they're looking at locations where they might purchase land, and they're looking at Northside Drive out here and the one big street over Howell Mill, and they find eight <coughs> different locations. Which one should they choose? Yeah, the third one, huh? OK. OK, now why is this a probability thing? Because you see, you make a decision. And there's purchase price, and there's OK. But what you don't know is what's going to happen around you. The location on how milk might get better, but it might deteriorate around you. And so the, the place where you put your Chick-fil-A might look good at one moment and later look much worse, or the other way around. There's all kinds of considerations in there. All right, the Trader Joe's, they, they, they sell turkeys at any time, but they sell tons and tons of them at Thanksgiving time. So you're already planning ahead for next year. You're negotiating your contracts. They're going to have hundreds and hundreds of turkeys at each location. But how many? They do spoil. And if you oversupply, you run the risk of, of absorbing a huge local loss. <laughs> and if you undersupply, then you lose a lot of customers who are really angry with you when they come in three days before Thanksgiving and can't buy a turkey. Example four should strike a chord here. Is there any use for a computer program which doesn't work? It doesn't work in that when you feed it the data, it gives you the correct answer only, say, 51% of the time. I mean, would, wouldn't you throw it away? Is it, could you make, some, somehow could you make good use of a program that you know 
will only give you the correct answer about 51% of the time. Yeah? Does it tell you the correct answer or not? Pardon? Does it tell you the correct answer? No. It says, it's like, uh, it's like the, the guy down the hall. I, he never makes a mistake, right? But you know that he does. It's, a, it's an interesting question. You know, your instincts are telling you, no, write the code correctly and be certain that the answer is correct. The real world is a little bit more complicated than that. And nobody knows whether the code is correct anyway. The code has so many hundreds and hundreds of thousands of lines in its legacy, and it's been <laughs> written and rewritten and patched and et cetera so many times, you know it's got bugs in it. You know on occasion it will return bad answers. Question? Is it the same answer for two separate Not necessarily. You would think so but not necessarily, because there are other things that happen. Yeah.